The Lockheed U-2 Dragon Lady is a reconnaissance aircraft developed during the Cold War for high-altitude intelligence gathering. Designed to fly above enemy air defenses and collect strategic surveillance data over vast territories. It routinely flies at altitudes near 70,000 feet, nearly 13.2 miles above the Earth's surface. The reconnaissance aircraft first took flight on August 1, 1955, and has remained in active military service for nearly 70 years. Its wingspan is approximately 103 feet, longer than a Boeing 737s, which allows the aircraft to glide with incredible efficiency at extreme altitudes while consuming minimal fuel during long-duration flights. So last night I had uh, steak and eggs about 17.30. Uh, this morning was a bagel at about 6.30. I uh, went to bed at 2200, got up at 6. U-2 pilots wear full-pressure spacesuits similar in design to those used by NASA astronauts, because the Dragon Lady operates at altitudes where atmospheric pressure is too low to sustain human life without protective gear. The suit protects against hypoxia, a condition caused by low oxygen levels that can lead to cognitive impairment, unconsciousness, and death sometimes in under 30 seconds. Without the suit, a pilot's blood could begin to boil due to a phenomenon related to Armstrong's line, which occurs at roughly 63,000 feet. Before each mission, pilots undergo about one hour of pure oxygen pre-breathing to eliminate nitrogen from their bloodstream which prevents decompression sickness. Full pressure suit maintains a stable internal pressure, supplies oxygen, and protects against freezing temperatures, which can plunge below minus 76 degrees Fahrenheit at the U-2's operational ceiling. The helmet includes a sealed visor to maintain pressure and prevent condensation and official Air Force documentation confirms that it is equipped with a built-in visor heater. Modern U-2 pilots follow a low-fiber diet before flights to reduce waste and improve comfort. suit is equipped with a urine collection system, as U-2 missions often last between 8 to 12 hours. Staying hydrated while maintaining comfort is essential for performance and survival over long durations. Alright sir, when you're ready, deep breath and hold. Despite the intense demands of the role, piloting the Lockheed U-2 Dragon Lady is widely regarded as one of the most prestigious positions in military aviation. Since 1955, fewer than 1,000 pilots have earned the qualification to fly it. While they undergo specialized preparation for high altitude flight, U-2 pilots typically do not receive centrifuge training as their missions involve minimal G-forces unlike spaceflight profiles. 115, 1.4. All right, when you're ready, one more deep breath and hold. I think it's just a great airplane. The fact that they could design something that uh, essentially in the 50s that is still around flying, they've modified it heavily since then, but essentially designed from the 1950s. So solidly built and uh, just a great airplane that uh, stood the test of time. And it's just really fun to fly. Although the U-2 is equipped with a basic autopilot, 
It is rarely used, as the aircraft's sensitive controls and unique flight characteristics require constant manual input from the pilot. Unlike combat pilots, U-2 aviators focus exclusively on surveillance, reconnaissance, and intelligence gathering. After donning the full pressure suit, the U-2 pilot is transported to the aircraft in a modified van, specially equipped to accommodate the bulk and fragility of the pressurized gear. A physiological support team assists the pilot before departure, ensuring systems such as oxygen supply, communication, and suit pressurization are functioning properly at the aircraft. The van is climate controlled to protect suit systems in extreme temperatures. The U.S. Air Force currently maintains a select community of trained U-2 pilots, estimated to number between 30 and 40. Stationed primarily at Beale Air Force Base in California, where high-altitude operations are routinely launched. It's, it's so great being a part of something that's withheld all this time. Uh, I'm a firm believer that the U-2 is going nowhere. The squadron is going to be around for a good minute. As small as it is, everyone's a real tight-knit family, and it's, it's good to come to work every day with my brothers and sisters. Due to the restrictive nature of the suit, U-2 pilots need assistance from the ground crew to climb aboard the aircraft. Simple tasks like boarding and strapping in become complex and physically taxing. To board, the pilot ascends a small ladder attached to the fuselage, maneuvering carefully inside the narrow cockpit to avoid disturbing the highly sensitive onboard surveillance systems. Before the canopy is sealed, the ground crew conducts a thorough integrity check on the suit and cockpit systems, verifying oxygen flow, communications, and pressure seals to ensure operational safety. The pilot is strapped into a custom-fitted seat designed to accommodate the rigid suit while maximizing comfort and reducing physical strain during extended operations. The U-2's airframe is constructed primarily of titanium and aluminum alloys providing a strong yet lightweight structure capable of withstanding severe temperature swings and mechanical stress at high altitudes. The cockpit canopy is sealed for structural integrity, but remains unpressurized, making a full pressure suit essential for pilot survival at cruising altitude. Pogos, small, detachable outrigger wheels, support the aircraft's long, flexible wings while taxiing. They are inserted by ground crews before takeoff and drop out due to gravity once the aircraft is airborne. After takeoff, the pogos are left behind on the runway and retrieved by support personnel, ready to be reinstalled upon landing. The U-2's sleek design reduces drag and boosts lift for long, high-altitude flights, but sacrifices speed. During takeoff and landing, U-2 pilots are guided by chase cars, high-performance vehicles like the Chevrolet Camaro or Dodge Charger, 
driven by fellow pilots providing real-time feedback. The chase car provides real-time visual feedback as the U-2's cockpit offers limited visibility, particularly near the ground where spatial awareness is critical. During takeoff, pilots must carefully manage pitch and lift rather than power output. The General Electric F-118-101 engine delivers steady thrust, and the primary risk lies in stall or pitch instability rather than overspeed. Once airborne, the U-2 climbs rapidly to over 70,000 feet, cruising well above commercial airliners and most conventional military aircraft. Though certain high-performance platforms like the Global Hawk have also reached similar altitudes. From that altitude, Pilots enjoy a rare perspective of Earth's curvature, with exceptional visual range under ideal conditions. But flying at the edge of space presents its own challenges. The thin air, lack of reference points, and constant threat of turbulence mean that pilots must rely heavily on instruments, navigation systems, and oxygen monitoring. Even minor atmospheric variations can cause significant drift, so pilots make constant micro-adjustments to compensate for crosswinds and thermal currents. The CIA played an essential role in the U-2's early development and deployment, initially managing its missions before the aircraft transitioned to Air Force control in the late 1970s. In its early years, the U-2 was used to fly over Soviet, Chinese, and Cuban territory, capturing high-resolution imagery and intercepting communications that were otherwise inaccessible to Western intelligence. On May 1, 1960, CIA pilot Francis Gary Powers was shot down over the Soviet Union by an SA-2 surface-to-air missile, triggering a major Cold War confrontation that exposed U.S. aerial spying efforts. Following the incident, the CIA temporarily halted direct overflights of Soviet airspace, but continued to use the U-2 in peripheral and allied regions with enhanced countermeasures and secrecy. Modern U-2 missions rely on sophisticated sensors, including synthetic aperture radar, optical cameras, and electronic signal intelligence systems that can detect and analyze military movements, installations, and communications. The U-2 can also carry advanced data links, enabling near real-time transmission of collected intelligence to command centers and analysis hubs. Though the speed of delivery can depend on encryption, bandwidth, and satellite relay systems. Throughout its career, the U-2 has been involved in numerous classified operations, including missions over the Middle East, North Korea, and Afghanistan, shaping U.S. foreign policy and military strategy behind the scenes.
At cruising altitude, the cockpit environment is surreal. A mix of total silence, deep blue skies, and extreme weather conditions at the edge of Earth's atmosphere. To stay ahead of evolving threats, the U-2 fleet has been continually upgraded with modern countermeasures, next-generation optics, and advanced signal interception gear, helping it remain relevant alongside drones and satellites in a changing intelligence landscape. During landing, U-2 pilots must perform a slow and controlled approach as the aircraft's massive wings and low stall speed make rapid descents dangerous. Precise touchdown handling is crucial. The pilot must keep the aircraft perfectly balanced and aligned with the runway while managing pitch control during the final phase of descent. The chase car that comes in uh, at very high speeds, taking that turn onto the runway very rapidly as we come in to do our landings, um, they're sort of our eyes and ears on the outside of the jet. When you're in this suit and you have the helmet on, uh, your peripheral vision sort of occluded. Uh, everything's, you get little temporal distortions. It can be a little bit weird. So the mobile driver, while he's driving onto the runway, getting right behind you, assists you just in, in reassuring you by you know, telling you your altitude above the runway. As the U-2 touches down, the tail wheel must remain stable ensuring that the aircraft doesn't tip to one side. If it does, one of the wingtips may contact the ground, potentially damaging equipment. Even after all these decades, the U-2 Dragon Lady continues to serve as a vital asset in the U.S. reconnaissance fleet. Flying missions that satellites and drones can't match in persistence, flexibility, or human control. If you're enjoying the content, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future videos.